Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Jim Conroy with uh, Pursued CDC. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the SBA 504 program and specifically about the SBA 504 refinance without expansion uh, program. A little bit about our company. Uh, Pursuit has actually existed since 1955 and we're a multi-pronged uh, entity with a common mission of providing creative financing to help small businesses. Um, we've got a, a number of uh, programs, over 15, as well as a staff of over 100 and managed assets of over $1.8 billion. Uh, but despite all of the different programs and entities that we have, uh, all of us are, are committed to that mission statement of trying to provide creative financing to help small businesses. And you, uh, mostly uh, bankers that are listening in today, should know that we work in a collaborative way with uh, the banking industry and are not uh, intended to be seen as a competitor. So I think uh, everything that we talk about today, uh, specifically regarding the 504 program, uh, should be looked at from your, your perspective as not only an opportunity to provide value add to a customer of yours, but I think also it provides a substantial benefit to the bank as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Uh, first, as I uh, mentioned, I'm Jim Conroy. I'm the president of Pursuit CDC. I've been with the company for 25 years and manage uh, the, the territory, the three state territory that we operate in, in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I'm Ross Panko, Senior Vice President of Pursuit. I've been with the company for almost 15 years and I uh, manage a good chunk of the uh, upstate New York market. I'm boots on the ground working on a few dozen of these 504s a year. Great, thanks. And we're uh, thrilled that everyone could join. Um, you know, with, uh, with with the 504 refinance uh, expansion pro or with refinance without expansion program, it's really important to make sure that we do a quick overview of the 504 program itself. Uh, that is the kind of the expansion program, the program that existed since the uh, early 1980s. And then we can talk a little bit more about the difference between those programs or that product and and the 504 refinance without expansion product. Uh, and then we can go through a couple of examples that I think do a really good job of crystallizing why it is that this program is, is so impactful and why you should be thinking about this uh, for just about any owner-occupied transaction you see. First, with regard to the 504 expansion product, uh, a lot of our presentations are really geared towards the benefit of the, to the borrower, which uh, again here, uh, the big benefit of the 504 is that there's only 10% equity that's required on the part of the borrower. Uh, the 504 is a, uh, is a bond transaction, which means that it's a longer term than conventional financing usually. There's a 10 year 504 loan, a 20 year 504 loan, and a 25 year 504 loan. Not only are those uh, longer term, uh, it's a fixed interest rate for that entire uh, period of time. And the interest rates are, are usually at or below market rates. Currently, uh, the, the rate is around 4%. And I mentioned earlier that one of the things that I, I really encourage bank partners to do is to think about 504 in every owner-occupied real estate transaction you see. It truly is one of the best economic development products available to small businesses. And it, uh, it can not only help you in, in, um, in kind of your competitiveness because we have found uh, a number of uh, times when a bank has not mentioned the 504 and wound up losing the transaction because another bank that's competing for that same customer has mentioned the 504. So in some cases, it may not be a great option for the customer. They may not want to go that direction, but the mere fact that you're presenting it to them I think usually conveys to the borrower that you're a resourceful partner, that you're looking out for their best interest. And as I mentioned, sometimes, surprisingly, uh, the borrower would want to do the deal and, uh, and actually makes it a competitive advantage for you in presenting that 504 option. 
So the 504 is specifically uh, geared to help with fixed asset transactions. Uh, so we're talking about real estate primarily, about 90% of our transactions are real estate related. However, uh, it could be used for large equipment purchases, things like uh, printing presses, uh, car crushers, we've done barges before are eligible. The only thing that aren't eligible are, are things that can uh, basically drive, uh, have wheels or airplanes, but most other large fixed asset projects are eligible. And because a large chunk of the transactions that we're talking about are real estate, uh, it does have to be an owner-occupied commercial real estate transaction. So what that means is that there's an operating company that's actually going to locate in the in the building that's being purchased, and that operating company must occupy at least 51% of a building uh, that's currently existing, or if they're going to construct a building with 504 proceeds, they have to occupy at least 60% of that building. Uh, but oh, so long as the project meets the, that eligibility criteria, the 504 is a great product to consider. The simple way to think of the 504 is it, this uh, chart here, which is 50, 40, 10. The bank is, uh, does 50% of the project cost and are secured by a first lien or first mortgage on the asset that's being acquired. The 504, which we process, is in a second lien or second mortgage on the product. And then the borrower is, has the last 10%, which is the equity contribution. So right off the bat, this structure tells you, it, compared to a conventional deal, the borrower would normally, for an owner-occupied commercial real estate, might have to put 20% down. So there's less down payment that the borrower is required. Uh, the 40% that I'm talking about the 504 with would have a 25-year fixed rate at 4%. And then the bank would have a, a first mortgage for 50%. Uh, common rates in terms that we're seeing now is a 10-year term with a 20-year amortization and a five-year rate reset with rates anywhere between four and a half to 5%. So not only is the borrower reducing the amount of equity that they have to put down, uh, but they're getting longer term uh, fixed rate financing at preferred interest rates on our 40%. Uh, and, the, and the bank uh, is still able to get a decent rate and spread on the first mortgage because of the other benefits that the 504 are providing. So again, an important takeaway for the bankers that are listening in is you have a first mortgage or a first lien on a piece of collateral where you have a 50% loan to value. So if it's a, uh, if it's a, a, a questionable transaction where you're having a hard time uh, being able to get it through your underwriting group, uh, a 50% loan to value could make a meaningful difference in your ability to get that loan approved or not. And imp another important thing here that we sometimes run across is banks concerned about, you know, losing too much of the transaction, that our 40% is kind of taking food off of your plate. It it's important to realize that we're a transactional lender. We're coming in for this transaction. We're doing the, the second mortgage or second lien. And then we're off. We're, we're not offering the borrower any depository services or any insurances or any other ancillary products that the bank is going to want to provide to that client. So again, the ability to get the customer with the help of the 504 program enables you to then have that customer for ancillary opportunities uh, and products that the bank offers. There are a couple of situations in which that 50, 40, 10 uh, percentages can be different. Uh, the SBA has looked historically at losses in the 504 portfolio and identified two key trends. One is if it's a startup business, there's a higher likelihood of default. And the other is if there's a, um, if it's a special purpose real estate, that is it cannot be easily reconfigured for another business use. Uh, there is a higher uh, percentage of, of loss. So as a result, what the SBA has done is they've changed the 50, 40, 10 calculation. If it is a new business, that is it's existed for less than two years, uh, or as a startup, there's an additional 5% equity requirement. 
and you'll see that the bank amount stays 50 percent the 504 second adjusts down to 35 percent and the borrower's equity contribution goes up five uh, percent to 15. if it happens to be both a startup and a special purpose real estate the equity contribution is increased to 20 percent in which case it's 50 percent bank 30 percent 504 20 percent uh, equity examples of special purpose real estate can be car washes it can be uh, indoor athletic facilities uh, swimming pools gas stations things uh, hotels things like uh, like i mentioned uh, if that business fails and we needed to liquidate the collateral there's a very limited number of people that could use that that building for something other than its intended use and as a result uh, it has a higher likelihood of, of losses from a default situation. I should mention if, if anyone has questions along the way, we are gonna be aggregating those questions and, uh, and addressing them at the end of the presentation. So there is through the uh, GoToMeeting channel, uh, you can uh, write a question in that box and uh, we'll address them at the end. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you, within the 25 years that I've been doing uh, 504 lending, we are truly in the golden age of 504. Uh, the program utilization has absolutely exploded over the last several years. Uh, and it's really impressive when you consider the fact that uh, we've, we've gone through this process despite having the pandemic and the effect of the government lockdowns that have occurred. Uh, and I think there's a myriad of reasons why we're seeing this, but the, the, the most important takeaway is, is that I think the 504, the, the word about the 504 is out. Uh, borrowers are aware of it more than they ever have been. I think the, uh, the, the name recognition of SBA because of the COVID crisis and the impact that they played with PPP and, and the idle program and the section 1112 payment relief that uh, the business community now looks at SBA in a different light. And I think that has created an opportunity and maybe a, a greater exposure to the program than we have ever enjoyed. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, it would be in, in a bank's best interest if the project meets uh, the eligibility criteria for 504 to present it, and it could help you get the transaction. Uh, I think now you might need to just uh, expect that the borrower is already aware of the 504 program. Um, so it, it, to the extent that you can get even more comfortable with the product, uh, you're going to be better for it. But I, I, you know, I think the, also the, the, the benefits of the program have existed throughout, and I think those are really resonating in today's environment, which is less money down, uh, the, the longer term fixed interest rates, we've, we've enjoyed historically low interest rates in the 504 program for a while, which has been another big, uh, a big reason for our uh, increased activity. And, uh, and I think there's also a number of businesses that really haven't uh, suffered too, too terribly through the pandemic. Um, I'm thinking of distribution companies, um, certain uh, certain services based businesses that either have not been affected or uh, have actually improved operations because the cost of doing business has been reduced with people sitting in their in their offices as opposed to out selling going to conferences and, and things of that nature so the the program utilization has increased uh, from from 19 to 20 from 20 to 21 and 21 to 22. Uh, our company set a, a record with volume uh, in, in uh, 2020, and then we blew that out of the water last year, and we're well on our way to doing it again this year. So uh, again, a great time, a golden age, if you will, of 504 uh, lending. We look forward to it continuing. Well, <clears throat> so one of the challenges now in talking about 504 refinance is the industry has had a hard time really trying to market this effectively. It's very simple to think about a, a transaction where a, a borrower wants to buy a piece of, of real estate that's owner occupied. You can kind of immediately think 504. The refinance program is a little more nuanced. Uh, and as a result of that, this, this webinar is being put together and our staff are trying as best we can uh, to really kind of demonstrate uh, the, the wide variety of, of opportunities that exist where a 504 refinance can be thought of. 
And you know, sometimes what, what this really means is not just looking at the 504 as a business attraction tool or to make the bank more competitive in a situation, although I, I do think this, this program helps it. But for the first time, I think we're all allowing bankers to kind of look within their own portfolio and see borrowers that have existing uh, debt that would qualify for a 504 refinance. And it makes a lot of sense uh, for them to be able to refinance the debt that they currently have, enjoy the longer term lower interest rates, maybe even cash out and, uh, and, and use some money for working capital or other things that they need to do to grow. And so a little history, this, the refinance program was a pilot initiative that came out after the economic crisis uh, of 2008. And it was very successful for a very short period of time before at sunset and then came back as a permanent product in 2015. The SBA uh, admittedly has put some limitations on eligibility that have not made this as, as successful a, a rollout as everyone would have hoped. We are seeing some tremendously uh, improved volume recently, uh, but I think overall this is an underutilized program and it goes back to what I was saying about it's a little more challenging to, uh, to market to banks on how it can be most impactful. So what I've done here is, is on this slide, presented a lot of different uh, questions that might trigger, is a 504 refinance a good opportunity uh, to look at to help this borrower? And um, you know, when, when you're talking about a borrower that's looking for um, you know, a term out of a line of credit. Not many people are thinking of 504 refinance, but what might happen is if they have equity in their real estate and we can refinance the mortgages on their real estate and do a cash out, then they can effectively pay down or pay off their line of credit and put it on a mortgage style amortization. And it still helps them uh, to achieve what it is that they need to achieve. And we've got a great example of how that worked uh, effectively uh, with, a, with a business in a few slides. Uh, but I, I challenge everyone on the, on the phone today to really kind of think about the refi program and the options uh, that, that exist to try and help your small business customer using this program. One point so, I wanted to add there is, is um, with, the, with the cash out, like the instance of, of paying down a line of credit, um, and we'll cover these in the next couple of slides, is the 504 can go to a higher loan to value than, than maybe you'll be able to in a traditional bank loan as well. So where it might not be possible for you to refine, you know, add that line of credit to, to a mortgage with the 504, we may be able to do that. And, and obviously a customer who's having trouble, you know, paying out a line of credit, you know, might not be something you want to advance additional money to. Um, the 504 may be a way to help them and reposition them to, to you know, come back and be you know the customer you you look you had when you originally signed them up. Yeah, good good point, Ross. And um, I should also say uh, uh, the 504 second mortgages uh, can be anywhere from from fifty thousand dollars up to five and a half million dollars. So um, I think you know the, the definition of small business that we typically try and talk about with this program um, could be a, a very large middle market type client and still benefit from the 504 program. We are seeing uh, a pretty significant uptick in the average loan size as a result of, of larger businesses being interested in using the 504 uh, as well as the 504 refinance program. So the, so the eligibility requirement uh, for a, a business to uh, be able to apply for a 504 refinance without expansion projects. So it, it, it's exactly what it means. The SBA does not want to use this program for someone who's doing an expansion as part of a, a refinance or a refinance as part of an expansion. We can still do that, that type of financing, but that's in the typical 504 structure. Uh, but in this situation, we're talking about a borrower who's got a debt on a property or a piece of equipment. They want to refinance that, maybe do some cash out, uh, but are not planning to do any kind of sizable expansion beyond that project. So what we first have to do is identify a qualified debt. 
And the qualified debt has to be a loan that has existed for over six months. We have to go back to when it was uh, initially closed and verify that it was used for an eligible 504 project cost. At least 85% of the use of those funds have to have been used for an eligible 504 project cost. Now, if, if we're talking about a loan that was a refinance of another loan, we go back to the original loan in order to consider it. So it could be a type of situation where a 20 year old business has rolled over a mortgage loan and it's a significantly larger loan right now, but it, but originally was a loan to buy the real estate and it, and it just has continued to increase over time, that can still qualify as a qualified debt. We also have to verify that the proposed financing will provide a benefit to the customer in terms of monthly payments. And um, that's usually relatively easy to do because we're talking about a, a 25 year amortization of the 504. And it has to be secured by the project collateral and used by a business. And importantly, that business has to have existed for over two years. So a big change that happened last year is previously the debt had to be over two years old, not six months. Um, they shortened that to six months, but the business still has to have existed for two years before being eligible uh, for consideration. Other changes last year uh, are that uh, the 504 refinance without expansion program can now refinance SBA 7A loans and can even refinance existing 504 loans so long as the first mortgage that was in front of the 504 is included in the refinance. We can't just refinance the second mortgage with the 504 and, and leave the first mortgage in place. So to go back to my original comment, um, the, the universe of opportunities for 504 has expanded dramatically as a result of the 504 refinance without expansion. Although these eligibility criteria do present a hurdle, um, I don't think it's, uh, it, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to see uh, a dramatically uh, less opportunities in the future. So, you know, keep us in mind on any deal that you think qualifies you can give us a call and within a couple of minutes, we should be able to properly determine eligibility as well as get you a one page summary sources and uses of funds based on the project parameters that, that you've uh, provided to us. And that goes a long way to being able to show the borrower how the 504 program actually is going to work and be beneficial to them. So we mentioned that there's an opportunity to do some cash out that uh, that money that's used for cash out does have to stay within the business. It has to be considered eligible business expenses, and we'll talk about what those are specifically. But our loan to value in the second mortgage, if there's no cash out, then we can go up to a 90% loan to value on that collateral, just like the 504 expansion program. But if there's cash out of any kind, eligible business expenses, we're limited to 85% loan to value. It's important to note as well that any cash that's taken out uh, of this transaction does uh, cannot exceed more than 20% of the value of the asset. So the eligible business expenses capped at 20% of the value of the asset can be used for uh, expenses that are going to be incurred within the next 18 months. So um, if you have uh, salaries or utilities, rent, inventory, you know, things of that nature, we can basically cut a check at the closing table and the borrower can use that money for those costs in the future. Or uh, we could use the, the cash out in order to pay down accounts payable or lines of credit. And in certain cases, uh, we can also use uh, the, the proceeds um, for inventory and other things that are being acquired. Uh, at the time of closing. So the ability to do a 20% cash out of the value of the asset provides a really nice opportunity for some small businesses. And this is a tremendous uh, example of how that works. So this is a company that's located uh, just outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. It was a manufacturing business that had some concentration in sales. Uh, the, uh, the, the company that they had a concentration with went through uh, a bankruptcy, which left them high and dry on a number of receivables, 
as well as uh, you know set them uh, on a course of trying to find uh, new customers in order to fill the gap that was that was uh, left by uh, by the bankrupt company leaving. So this transition in their business took a while, a couple of years or a couple of, uh, it was about a year in total. And so as a result, they had a, a, a year of really rough operating performance and they had some extended lines of credit and payables. Obviously the receivables were not being collected uh, and they, they wanted to try and, and ask their bank to do a term out of their line of credit or to provide some other form of capital because they had done a great job of cutting costs, identifying new customers so that they didn't have the concentration issue and they were building themselves back up. But obviously with the, with the most recent year end financial statements, they were not looking so good from the bank perspective and they had blown some, some covenants, specifically uh, you know, uh, cat, uh, cash flow covenants and, uh, and the current ratio covenants. So what happened in this situation is there were actually three properties that this business owned. One was for their office, one was for their manufacturing facility, and one was for their distribution. And we were able to refinance the mortgages on each one of those properties, do 20% cash out in the, in the properties where they had it available. And that cash out was used to pay down their payables and their line of credit. And we did the whole thing uh, by giving the borrower at least a, a million dollars of cash for working capital that they had needed. Uh, they, we provided substantial uh, cash flow relief because of the repayment terms. So we reduced their monthly payments very significantly from their existing debt. And we had cured their covenants because the, the money that was used to pay down their, their current uh, liabilities corrected uh, not only the, the, uh, the current ratio covenant that they had, but the, the reduced repayment terms also cured their cash flow covenant. We were able to do this without the incumbent bank uh, advancing any new money in this transaction. So this is a wonderful example of a business that walked into the bank and said, I'm looking to uh, get some working capital or to term out a piece of my line of credit. And that's the challenge that we're, we're kind of saying to you today is to think expansively on how the 504 refinance could work. Ordinarily, you wouldn't necessarily think a solution to this problem comes from a restructure of their mortgage debt. But in this case, it did, and it was very substantial. Um, on a smaller size uh, transaction, uh, this is a restaurant that's located in Albany. Um, they uh, operated a business very successfully um, in, a, in a leasehold facility, and then they bought another property uh, down the road and had a, a lease to, to buy option with the seller that they executed, but the seller's repayment terms were, were, not, uh, were not great. Um, and this borrower then went through COVID and with the disruption that they had uh, was, was in a kind of tough spot where they had a business that had been doing very well pre-pandemic, but was having difficulty with the, as a result of the pandemic. And then a seller note on the real estate project that uh, was, was really uh, hurting their ability to manage the business. So by refinancing the existing seller mortgage and providing uh, eligible business expenses as well, we not only helped this borrower reduce their monthly payments dramatically, but we gave them uh, $100,000 of cash that they used to cover their expenses and help them through the pandemic. Um, and this borrower has subsequently expanded to a third location and are doing tremendously well. So it's, uh, again, a great situation where we had a seller uh, mortgage, so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be an institutional uh, mortgage to be qualified as a 504 refinance without expansion option. Um, but uh, here's a, a smaller transaction that was just in, as impactful for this small business. So in, in summary, I think the, the, the biggest takeaways for the presentation are is, is one, the 504 program has tremendous utility for a variety of projects, not only new expansion projects, but also uh, you know, refinance opportunities 
um, when you're talking to businesses, trying to attract them to your bank, as well as businesses that are in your, your current portfolio. Uh, the second thing is, is that uh, Pursuit CDC operates in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. We are the second largest CDC that operates throughout the country. There's about 200 active CDCs that operate. So we are the ones that handle the SBA transaction. We pride ourselves on handling it uh, professionally and efficiently. So from a borrower standpoint, it's a, it's a smooth transaction. And then lastly, like I mentioned, we really see ourselves as a collaborative uh, entity with banks. So where we can share information or handle underwriting and present it back to you or go the extra mile to try and figure out a way to help a small business, if not with 504 with one of our other products. Um, when you send a transaction to us, we'll try and come up with a solution. Even if it's not the product that you're thinking of, uh, we go the extra mile to try and, and figure out a way to help. So with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back over. Ross, any last comments before we get to questions? Uh, no, nothing at, at the moment. There's a, I see a couple questions in, in, the, in the question thing here. Um, first one I see is uh, how old does a 504 loan need to be uh, before it can be refinanced? And uh, as, as long as that is you know, not, a, not a new business, uh, then it just needs to be six months old by the time it you know, funded six months by the time it's eligible to be refinanced. Yeah, the, the qualified debt applies to a 504, a 7A, uh, a bank mortgage, or a uh, an individual mortgage, as the case may be. It's it's the same criteria. So it, it's very easy to um, make a 504 project eligible for a 504 refinance project because it obviously was uh, at least 85% used for an eligible 504 project when it closed, as demonstrated by the fact that it's a 504. And then uh, second question here is, does the 504 borrower need to show the CDC or provide supporting documents after closing on how they use the 20% cash out for the business expenses? Uh, great, great question. Uh, no, uh, the SBA, uh, does want the borrower to provide an itemized list that, that we will keep in our file that says how they intend to use the money. And technically, uh, the borrower is subject to uh, audit by the SBA at some point in the future on how they use that money. Uh, but, um, but aside from, from that, uh, there's no requirements. I mean, I think we, we generally have to be sure of, of one overarching thing is that that money cannot be distributed out of the business and so long as they don't do that and they use it within the operation of the business either they can directly show that it, it benefited their company or um, offset other costs at some point um, you know either way there, there isn't much in the way of substantiation post uh, post closing just had another one come in and, and i can answer this uh does te does 10 percent cash flow enhancement apply even when refinancing uh, from non-SBA loans. So I think you're asking if, if we're refinanced the conventional loan and, and it, yes, it would apply unless the loan is, is going to balloon within the next five years. Yeah, if there's a, a balloon feature, the SBA calls that credit on unreasonable terms and it is eligible for any SBA product at that time. Even if, even if the balloon isn't for several years into the future, it still would be considered credit on unreasonable terms. I think I'll, I'll just add one other thing is, is um, you know, the 504 rates, you know, they're fixed for as long as 25 years. And, and I think all of us have seen rates come up a little bit of late, um, but you know, we're really spoiled by these pandemic rates, which probably nobody thought we'd ever see until we, we got to the pandemic. Um, but, you know, the reality is, you know, I think the way our federal government spending and, and everything that's happened in the world, you know, we could very easily be exiting what has been a, a very favorable rate environment really since the financial crisis. And uh, if the client's able to lock in part of their, their, probably their largest debt, which would be on their real estate for 20, 25 years at you know, around 4%, you know, that's going to really help them for the long term. 
and provide you as the banker, you know, opportunities to do other things for them as, as they continue to grow their business. We had a few more questions coming in here. Um, what type of documentation uh, do you need to send to Sacramento? Uh, so I, I'm not sure if you're talking about the, the debt documentation or, or the business expenses, but uh, in terms of the debt documentation, we, we basically need some sort of document that shows what that loan was for. And then we need to have the recorded mortgage uh, and executed note. So, and then we do need to show some sort of you know, recent payment history. Um, I think the SBA has given some, some flexibility to that because of the pandemic, uh, but we do need to demonstrate uh, to the SBA that you know, we're not taking on a, a loan that's, that's gonna end up being a bad one for SBA pretty quickly. Uh, and then on the, the business side of things, uh, we're looking um, basically, you know, if it's for future business expenses, we, we're just looking for them to tell us in a letter what, what essentially the business the expenses are gonna be. Um, and, and usually we match that up to what their operating expenses are and, and say, does it make sense? Or if they're going to pay down a line of credit or payables, then we probably have some sort of current statement as to you know what the line of credit balance is or what the accounts payable uh, balance is to, to justify it at the time of application. And uh, I got a question here, time permitting, can we talk briefly about 504 with expansion? Um, not sure specifically what we're looking for here. Um, Jim, do you want me to skip that? We got one other here. Well, I think uh, you know the, the the 504 with expansion is, um, is is someone going out and buying a new asset, so or a building um, of some sort. So uh, the the, the 50 40 10 uh, model is kind of what we follow for that transaction. And as I mentioned, one of the the real nice benefits is the, the bank is able to not only um, not only give the borrower an option to to only do 10% down, whereas the bank is probably typically looking at 20%, but the 40% 504 second mortgage does a, a 25 year fixed rate at the 4%. So it actually enhances the bank's uh, you know offering to the customer so that it not only uh, reduces the amount of cash that's needed, but also provides a benefit from the 504 uh, that, that in, in our experience, the borrower has really liked and as experiences have been in the last three years, um, more and more small businesses are opting for this. Um, you know, I mentioned quickly uh, earlier that um, there's a lot of banks that, that are looking at 504 as a way of, of establishing competitive advantage and that there's also a much greater awareness on the part of small businesses about the 504 program. It has historically been kind of a quiet, uh, little known product. And uh, I think it's definitely gotten its day in the sun and a lot more people are aware of it. So the challenge is, is for, for you as the lending community is to think of 504, not just for maybe the, the tired and the downtrodden that you might normally think of for an SBA transaction, but actually a 504 is to be used as a, as a competitive advantage in, in establishing uh, a better offer to uh, a customer that you want to try and appeal to. And we've got countless examples of deals that we're doing um, where the bank that brought it to us is the one that got the offer, despite having two, three, four other banks interested in the transaction. And the bank that brought it to us and, and offered the 504 is the one that got the transaction. So uh, I'm, I'm not just, uh, I'm not just uh, talking here. This is real, uh, really happening, and, and can be hugely consequential for your your uh, your calling program on the CNI space. I got a, another question here. Do you have to have money for a down payment of the loan? And if you have equity in property, will you need cash down? So I, I think this is in the context of a 504 refinance, and and so we when we put the example up we're basically the the pie chart that is you know 10 percent or 15 percent in in the the case of uh you know cash out deal where we, we can only go to 85 percent 
that remaining equities is really equity in the property, which would be verified by an appraisal. So basically we could finance up to an 85% loan to value by a new appraisal that we'd probably get even after an approval uh, if we were gonna cash out. Um, so if you had a, you know, a million dollar property, we could go to $850,000 in total financing against a million dollar property. Uh, if we're cashing out, if we're not cashing out, we could hypothetically refinance mortgage debt up to $900,000 on a million dollar property. But the, the point is, uh, is right that for a 504 uh, expansion product, we're expecting cash to be brought to the closing table uh, if we're talking about a 504 refinance, there is no cash that's brought to the table because the equity exists in the appraisal of the property, you know, net net of the uh, the mortgages that we're providing. So so this would, you know, in, in most cases, these 504 refinance without expansion products uh, are not requiring the borrower to put any cash down. 100% financing. Are there any other questions, Ross? Uh, there was just one more question as to whether or not they're going to get a copy of this the slide deck. And I, I think we could provide that in the link probably. Yes. Um, and then Fred, Fred, um, you asked a question about the, the 504 with expansion. You know, perhaps you want to talk about the, the refinance with expansion and basically if you're looking for somebody, you know, to that maybe has an existing facility with a mortgage, and they're looking to expand that facility or or buy another facility, um, we can refinance a mortgage on, you know, the same type of property that they're using for their business, whether it be that same property or or an additional property, and roll that into the expansion of another property, and oftentimes those types of projects, the equity is the equity in the real estate and, and you know, that has demonstrated by an appraisal. Uh, so you're able to, to, to do an expansion project without really any cash in. Um, so that's just another, you know, we didn't get into it really too much on this refi because it's, it's more of the expansion type refi program, but you can refinance that with an expansion project. And you can refinance up to, I believe now, 100% of what the expansion project costs are. So if you had a $2 million expansion, you could refinance up to $2 million in mortgage debt. I just got a question, what's defined as an expansion? So that would be, you know, you're, you're buying another location and you're looking to tie in, you know, the mortgage debt of the location you have or that could be, you know, you're putting an addition on a facility, is typical as to what we see. Yeah, or, or any renovation as well. Yeah. Um, we have had situations where a borrower wants to redo the roof and wants to use eligible business expenses for that. SBA technically calls that an expansion project, so that does not work. Anything else? Theo, are you out there? I'm here. It uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. Um, we have time for one more if anyone does have uh, any sort of last minute question that they would like to ask. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us today. Alrighty, doesn't look like we have any more questions. So thank you all for joining us. Um, as far as the slide deck, I will talk with Jim and Ross and we'll get get the get a copy out to all of you uh, as soon as we can. Thanks and have a Thanks great very day. Thank you much for participating. Have a great day. Bye everyone.